Hello, it's Scott Manley here, talking to you from an Airbnb in New Jersey, but I want to continue making videos. Today I want to talk to you about Japan. Japan was the fourth country to launch a satellite into orbit using its own launch vehicle, and it's a major space power today, having its own module on the International Space Station and a cargo spacecraft to supply this. But that first satellite they launched in 1970 was launched using this launch vehicle, the Lambda 4S. It took them five attempts to make this work, and if you're used to rockets, then the first thing that stands out to you is likely the fact that it's not standing straight up and down like everybody else's rockets. This angled launch design continued through many of Japan's domestically designed launch vehicles for decades and well into the 21st century. So what's the deal with Japan's crooked launch vehicles? So Japan's rocket research began in the 1950s. Immediately after World War II, Japan was forbidden to work on technologies which could be used for war, and every Japanese engineer and scientist that had been working in aviation or munitions had to find a new discipline, or in some cases they moved to other countries for possible work. The Treaty of Peace in 1951 freed them from their restrictions, and while many of the engineers at that time took the opportunity to advocate for Japan developing a jet uh, you know, passenger plane like Britain's Comet, there was a scientist named Hideo Itokawa, and he had his eyes set on space. Now, he had been an engineer who designed aircraft during the war, and after the war, he began to work on medical devices. In 1952, he visited the USA for six months to publish his work, and he discovered scientific publications on space medicine, and therefore by extension, space flight. When he returned to Japan, it was his opinion that Japan needed to pursue rocketry and space flight. He found other contributors, and one of his supporters uh, was a guy called Dr. Sumo Morata. He was an explosives expert who before the war, had launched amateur rockets, and during the war he does on many things such as designing the propellants for the massive 18.1 inch guns on the Yamato. According to some sources, he had quietly stepped, kept a stash of propellants for personal use after the war. Sounds like my kind of person. So Murata was able to supply propellants for the very first rocket experiments, starting small with the pencil rocket, a 1 point centimeter diameter and 23 centimeter long rocket. But over time, the project proved itself and created bigger and bigger rockets. The next step up was the baby, which were eight centimeters in diameter and 1.2 meters long. These are more in line with what we would call amateur rockets today, but they would carry instruments and recoverable payloads. But they wanted to go higher still because Japan wanted to participate in the International Geophysical Year of 1957-58. to And while the Soviet Union and the USA had orbital rockets planned for this, the small Japanese program would be hard pushed to reach the upper atmosphere. So the US had offered Japan the use of American sounding rockets, but Japan decided to give their homegrown program a chance to do it on their own. The team had planned a series of rocket designs named after the letters of the Greek alphabet. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and so on and so forth. But to hit the target in time, they decided to skip straight to Kappa. And so after several iterations, the Kappa 6 would be the first to hit the target altitude of 60 kilometers, and that was in 1958. The Kappa 6 was 5.4 meters long and 25 centimeters in diameter and massed about a quarter of a ton. That was a capability that Japan had needed to participate in the International Geophysical Year. The Kappa series of sounding rockets continued to get bigger and more capable, and they remained flying for many years. The Kappa 8, 9, and 10 were two-stage rockets that were over 10 meters long and massed about 1 to 2 tons, with apogees of 100 to 300 kilometers above the surface, and they would operate well into the 1980s. Although there was a period in 1957 when Japanese fishermen complained about the rockets landing in their waters and interfering with their work. After negotiations, sounding rocket uh, launches were allowed to continue from Kagoshima and Tanegoshima, but they were restricted to only a few months of each year. So the next step up from Kappa was Lambda. And that was a three-stage design aimed at getting about a thousand kilometers above the surface into the inner Van Allen belts. 
But beyond that, Mu was what they originally expected to be their first orbital rocket. But somebody did the math, and they realised that a four-stage Lambda could reach orbit, and so the Lambda 4S became an interim project to reach orbit ahead of schedule as quickly as possible. But there were political problems with Japan building large rockets. The Japanese constitution effectively forbade the development of non-defensive weapons, like ballistic missiles. So the trick was to make a large rocket that could never be used as a ballistic missile. And the compromise was to have no guidance on the rocket until absolutely necessary to get it into an orbit. So the first stages of the Lambda 4S were passively stabilised, using fins to keep them straight in the atmosphere. So instead of launching straight up, and then turning like most rockets, the launch mount placed it at an angle, pointed downrange in the intended direction of flight. So they would have to optimise the angle based upon the expected flight model you know, to ensure that the turn or the angle would develop into the ideal gravity turn for the target orbit and the payload mass. So that's the origin of this Japanese oddity, where they didn't launch their early rockets straight up. So the Lambda 4S was a four and a half stage solid rocket launch vehicle. It was one of the sol smallest rockets built at the time. And it has what, call, what rocket scientists call a high fineness ratio. That is the ratio of the length of the rocket to the diameter of the rocket. To put it another way, it looked really skinny. So the core was called the L735, 735 millimeter in diameter, 8.2 meters long, and that massed about nine and a half tons. When ignited, it generated 20, uh, 42 tons of thrust for 29 seconds. But on top of that, they had a pair of strap-on motors, uh, the SB310, 310 millimeters in diameter, and 5.7 meters long. And each of those were about half a ton on their own and generated about 10 tons of thrust for nine seconds. So they launched the first stages and they hit supersonic speeds before these burned out. If you compare this to your average rocket where the first stage burns for a couple of minutes, this was a very aggressive launch profile partly because the rocket really needed to get moving fast so that those fins would kick in and keep the rocket stabilised. So the second stage was the L735 and a third, which seems like an odd numbering system, but it's totally logical when you realise the second stage is basically one third of the first stage in terms of propellant load. So it's the same diameter, but only 3.9 metres long. This stage is a little more tame compared to the first, only generates about 12 tons of thrust. Now when this burns out, the rocket is getting really high in the atmosphere, so high that the atmosphere is quickly becoming too thin to stabilize the rocket with the fins. So the third stage uses spin stabilization with spin-up motors that would fire after stage separation and rotate the rocket at a speed of about you know, twice a second around its roll axis. Then the engine would fire. So the third stage was the L500, 500 millimetres in diameter, about 2.5 metres long and about 800 kilograms with 7 tonnes of thrust. After burnout, the rocket was then ascending towards orbital altitude, but it needed that fourth stage to make a carefully guided burn to put it into orbit. So the fourth stage would despin itself, reorient itself to point in exactly the right direction, and then spin itself back up before firing its engine at exactly the right time to put the payload into orbit. And it took them five attempts to make this work. But in January of 1970, Japan put its first satellite into orbit. The spacecraft was named Osumi. It was only 24 kilograms and it didn't carry really any scientific instruments. But Japan had joined a very exclusive club, being over only the fourth nation to launch a satellite. A few more of the Lambda rockets would fly as sounding rockets, but the Mu-4S would be the next orbital launch vehicle. The Mu rocket used a larger booster diameter, again, 1.41 metres. The first stage used the same strap-on boosters as the Lambda 4S, but it had eight of them instead of two. The first stage was still stabilised by fins, but the second stage lacks those fins, so I believe that it must have been spin-stabilised. The third stage was 860 millimetres in diameter, and then the fourth was 786 uh, millimetres, and that was encapsulated inside the fairing. And like the Lambda, it would be the only segment with any real guidance. 
So this launch vehicle had the payload capacity of about 160 kilograms. That was about five times what Lambda had done. So the Mu 4S launched its first satellite, Tansi, a test satellite in February of 1971, and it would carry two more scientific satellites on subsequent launches before the Mu 3C debuted. So the Mu 3C only had three stages, but now stage two had and three had proper guidance thanks to the development of liquid injection thrust vectoring nozzles. The first stage remained dumb, requiring the built-in launch angle, uh, those fins and the fancy launch stand. The 3C would uh, be upgraded with a longer first stage to make the 3H to give it improved payload capability. And the 3H then gained thrust vectoring um, on the first stage to become the Mu 3SI. And then the cluster of eight strap-on boosters would be replaced by boosters derived from the first stage of the Lambda to make the Mu 3S2, which operated through the mid-1990s. So the Mu-3 series launched uh, spacecraft, um, including Sakagake, which became the first interplanetary mission from a nation other than the US and the Soviet Union. Its target was Halley's Comet, and it would be joined by another spacecraft launched by the same rocket called Suisse, which would be launched uh, yeah, a few months later, again at the same target. The Mu-3 also launched the Hyten spacecraft, which was Japan's first lunar mission, and again, the first mission to the moon by a nation other than the US or the Soviet Union. I also want to point out that the manufacturing partner for all of these rockets was initially the Prince Motor Company, which would later become part of Nissan. So while they were building a car named the Skyline, they were building hardware which went a lot higher. So. The next step in the evolution was the MV, which broke the naming policy. It expanded the booster diameter to 2.5 meters, and it kept this diameter through all three stages, raising the payload to over a ton. The first stage now had a movable nozzle for thrust vectoring and control, and they eliminated the fins, which at this point wouldn't have done much beyond looking cool, but they still kept that angled launch mount uh, to keep them looking different from all those other solid boosters around the world. So the M5 launched the Nozomi spacecraft, that was Japan's first Mars probe, which had a number of technical problems, but eventually did make a fly past thanks to some help from Earth's gravity wells. And perhaps most poetically, the M5 launched the Hayabusa spacecraft, the original Hayabusa, not Hayabusa 2, and that would visit an asteroid which would be named Itokawa, named for the scientist who started Japan's space program. Now, the Mu5 stopped flying in 2006 because it was too expensive. It was replaced by the Epsilon, which used a solid booster from the much larger H2 rocket as its first stage. And then the second stage was the third stage of the M5, and the third stage was the kick motor that was needed for the Hayabusa mission. But crucially, the Epsilon abandoned the angle launch mount and switched to a far more boring te you know, vertical stand. But the good news is that in 2018, Japan used a four-stage version of its SS-520 sounding rocket to place a small CubeSat into orbit using the same unguided launch profile as the Lambda 4S. Starting from an angled launch mount, this was less than three tons and it now holds the record for the lowest mass launch vehicle to put a spacecraft into orbit. So Japan's habit of launching rockets at an angle is something that came as a solution to early political restrictions. And it isn't needed anymore, but there's no doubting that Japan has had a first spray space program ever since. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.